Analytics, Data Science, and Artificial Intelligence lecture. So this is a class. This is part of what we're doing. So you will see these lectures all the way out throughout this course, and I'm kind of excited to be doing them for you. So when we open up the course and we get started, um, generally you're going to have a use case. So in this case, the use case is going to be Cone, and they did a smart and predictive maintenance program using the Internet of Things smart sensors all the way across the buildings that they maintain to kind of minimize downtime and, you know, again, make sure that users don't suffer too bad in case the heating or the cooling fails. Now, the idea behind this is that the sensors are sampling the data coming in off the machinery. So if you have machinery that's starting to fail or starting to do something weird, it's going to start giving indications that the smart sensors are going to see. That can be sent back to a central database or to a central data system and parsed out so that you end up having an air condition that gets highlighted, gets flagged, and then gets sent up to someone to take a look at. Or the machine itself can go, oh, this is really common. That compressor is about to go down. You can see, you can tell um, it's sucking too much voltage, or it's doing something weird with the voltage, or it's doing something weird with how it performs. It has a model that says if it's doing this behavior or sending out this air code, that this is what you need to go do to fix it. So this can either be fixed by turning it on or off again, believe it or not, that hard reboot is a thing, or I have to send out a maintenance person to go take care of it because of that error code. And that's essentially what the whole idea behind what Cone has done to kind of save themselves some money and save themselves some time is use the error codes coming in off of the, 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 the devices, use sensor data, turn it into a great big, huge, gigantic plot on here's how all my buildings are performing, and then send out maintenance when you need to. It's kind of neat. It's a way of making sure that buildings are, have a lot of preventive maintenance, something proactive. And again, a lot of the things we do in business right now are pretty reactive. We don't really do a lot of proactive stuff. So when you get someone actually working on proactive, you start realizing how much money you can save. Not only how much money you can save, but how much time you can save and really focusing on the critical things. So we're changing our business environments and evolving needs for decision support and analytics. We are just at the beginning of this. This whole process over the next 20, 30 years is going to fundamentally alter how we run companies. And again, our company automation is going to get to be more and more important because more and more of our decisions are going to be based on bigger and bigger pools of data. And with you being here, you're learning about how is this all going to work. So we're still in the baby infancy steps of all this. This is only years old. It's not that old. But we're going to be making big bet, high risk decisions based on data. And that data that you guys are going to be generating and you're going to be working with and you're going to be using to make those are going to cross cut across divisions, are going to cross cut across organizations, may actually cross cut across entire business lines. Now, there are other things that you're going to do that are kind of repetitive but high risk, you know, things like budget or things like product, things like product build, things like product turn off. So we're going to stop building this product because it no longer has um, the ability to make money or we're going to turn that product over to a generic manufacturer because that's how that works. But you can do high risk um, repetitive work. You can do high risk um, decision making that requires group work. You can make ad hoc decisions that are arise periodically. You may have a product that was really popular five years ago, got featured in a movie five years later, and all of a sudden that product is super hot again. Well, given that hockey stick of how we do business, right, that initial peak is where we sell most of our product, and then you have the rest of it, the long tail, right? You may have that second peak in there because it showed up in popular culture. You, know, you may not be prepared for that, but if you know something's coming along for a movie and you can get a feel for the idea of how popular that movie's going to be based on how popular other movies have been with those actors and that director and that um, process. So like we know the Marvel movies are always popular. We know that Game of Thrones was wildly popular and had a big peak almost to the point where they were making their own little follow off products. So you had Game of Thrones initial peak and then you had going into long tail. Then you had Game of Thrones the movie. TV series, and you had another huge peak. We sold more books, we sold more associated products, we sold more cosplay costumes, we sold more books, we sold more product. And that's where those ad hoc decisions can come in. You can increase manufacturing, or you can increase digital delivery, or you can scale your systems based around special events on that second peak and go into a different long tail. So it's kind of neat how that will work, but you'll have all the data there. You just have to understand how to carve that data out so you can make better decisions about how it works. 
Then you've got some delegated decisions to individuals or small groups. These may be people that are working on small subsets. You may be working on a marketing plan. You may be working on a production model. You may be working on a small change to the product, whether that's a product design, a product um, marketing, advertising, all those other things that are going to come down to small group did work, but you're still going to be working with the big data, uh, big data pools and other things. So there are two ways of taking a look at decision making process. And I know this sounds kind of weird that we're actually talking about how do humans make decisions because we want our computers to make decisions the same way humans do. So there's two different processes here, one by Quinn and one that's covered in the book. So we have a four step process or a seven step process. And we'll kind of go through each one of these as we kind of go through this. Right, so your four step process is define the problem, i.e. a decision, a situation that may deal with some difficulty or an opportunity, right? A challenge or an opportunity. And you'll hear this in business all the time. It's a challenge or it's an opportunity. If it's a challenge, it's generally more fun because you gotta fix something that's broken. If it's an opportunity, it's equally as fun because now you gotta go do something really cool, increase visibility, brand, market, whatever, to get through that opportunity. Now you need to construct a model that describes that real world problem. We have biases, right? Surprisingly enough, everyone has biases. I have biases. When you're doing research, and one of the things, especially at the doctoral level, you are looking at biases, implicit, explicit biases as you kind of go through, and you can build those into your model, and you don't want to. So you want to try to construct this neutral model that describes the real world problem with as little bias as possible, and that is a really hard thing to do. Right? And it's just because we have them, all right? It's not that big a deal. As long as you know you have them, you can make your model either too optimistic or too pessimistic. If your general outlook on life is generally optimistic, then your model will reflect that optimistic outlook. If you're generally pessimistic, your model will reflect that as well. So you want to kind of balance all that. You may want to have more than one person working on the model to make sure you get a good neutral tone across that. That is really more factual based. In some models, if you have check marks, if you have marker points that you can predict, if you're trying to predict future behavior, if you have marker points on when someone did a thing based on a previous marketing or ad campaign or a previous product launch or something else, you can try to match your model to those previous points to increase accuracy of your model. You want to identify any possible solutions to the model problem and evaluate the solutions. And again, that's going back and checking your checkpoints in the past, trying to figure out how close the future predictions are to being realistic. Right? So if you have like something weird, a 1% probability of something weird happening, that's still a 1% probability. One out of 100, something could happen. But is it a realistic issue? And then the human will come in, compare, choose, and recommend a potential solution to the problem. Now, the machine can do this as well. But this is where human and machine interface come in, right? Is the data good? Does the human trust the, the data? That's the other big one. Do we trust the data that we're looking at to be representative of reality, as far as I understand reality, and recommend that potential solution to the problem? Does the human looking at the data have a bias that we need to worry about, right? So lots of interesting things that go along into that decision-making process. Humans are really interesting when it comes to how we work. And you get into some psychology when you get into big data. So it's kind of neat. Now, Quain has a seven-step process. And what's interesting about this is the way it starts off. And you have to understand the decision you have to make. You know, and it seems like, oh, we make decisions every day. I make a decision to have some coffee in the morning, to get in the car, to go do a thing, get on a plane, go travel to this client, go someplace else. But it's the realization that a decision is necessary. Sometimes we want to push off that decision. We will procrastinate. Humans will procrastinate. I know that's news. In other words, you have to identify and define the type of decision that needs to be made. Is it a small decision? Is it, do I want to have coffee today? Or do I want to have coffee with cream and sugar today? You know, what kind of coffee do I want to have? That's a simple decision. Okay. Now, hard seltzers are becoming really popular in the market. And I have an empty assembly line that used to make you know, regular seltzer water. Easy enough to convert over. And maybe I can make a specialized brand for a city, keep that plant running have a city branded type of, of hard seltzer and maybe get it into the local bars. That's a big decision, right? There's a huge decision in there. It sounds really, really good. I can repurpose a plant. I can save some jobs. I can get something really, really cool for my town or for my city. I can maybe get it locally branded, maybe get some support from the Chamber of Commerce, from City Hall, maybe get some tax cuts. You know, there's a whole lot of things that go into that, making that decision. You don't just thumbs up and say, this sounds good. You have to collect all the information. You have to do that when you're doing this process. 
but then you need to identify all the alternatives, right? Well, well, maybe a hard seltzer or something, maybe a seltzer water, maybe a bottled water, maybe something else, some other product, right? Branded for a local town. Um, maybe that town's got something special, like the town I live in is we're called Grit City. Maybe I can make Grit City, you know, seltzer water or something, you know, something different. Identify all the alternatives and look at all the market segments, whether it's water, whether it's a hard cider, whether it's, it's something else, something I can get into stores to sell. And then I want to evaluate the pros and cons. So maybe I don't have a real good way of getting product out. Maybe that product is just isn't pulling well in marketing. Maybe I need a better, better marketing campaign. Maybe I need to work closer with the city. You know, again, evaluate your pros and cons. Is this really a way I can make money? Um, is it going to be too much to try to open up that, that bottling line? Is it going to be too much to try to hire people back? Did I already fire people? You know, honestly, you've got to take a look at all the pros and cons for what you're doing and then select the best alternative and then finally make the decision. This is what we're going to do. We're going to make bottled water for our city that's branded and then we're going to try to get it into all the local shops because, hey, it's great city water. And that sounds really weird, doesn't it? You know, like have a little logo on it, maybe some like octopus kind of looking thing because that's our other city city logo is a little octopus. You know, we have a paper pulp, a paper mill processor here in town. This is really kind of neat. So maybe we can get that and do it that way. Maybe we can tie that octopus into our local hockey team, the Seattle Kraken, right? So again, making the decision, I've kind of figured it out. And then I want to go back and evaluate the impact of your decision. How much did it cost? Can I make money on it? What's my return on investment? What does marketing look like? What do all these other things look like? And in, in, impact. Did I help my town? Did I help my city? Did I help my people? Did I help my factory? Right? All these other things. And then a bonus step, right? So the eighth step on this is alter your decision as necessary over time. Seriously. And this is one of the things that they don't talk about in a lot of ways is actually going back and evaluating whether your decision was good, bad, or ugly. Right? You will make good decisions. You will make bad decisions and you will make really horrendous decisions. The question is, how do you recover from them to try to turn them all into good decisions? Right? So not everything you do is going to be a good decision. You will have bad decisions. You'll, make, you'll miss it just by a little bit or sometimes you'll miss it by a lot. Don't be afraid of those. Just go ahead and step in and change your decision over time. So maybe uh, water wasn't quite the thing we wanted to do. Maybe we wanted to go more for something we can get into, into bars and into other things. Maybe we needed to sponsor uh, uh, part of the, the July 4th celebrations here in town. You know, maybe I didn't do something. Maybe I did do a thing. Maybe my marketing wasn't complete. And maybe I need to go back and check my marketing. Maybe I need to go back and check and see um, how much does it really cost to manufacture that bottle of water? And then what price point can I drop it to to still make a, a profit enough to keep everything moving? So again, don't be afraid to go back and alter your decision as necessary over time. And that's where big data and predictive analytics comes in. You can be constantly updating your model with new and new and new data and check and see if, you're, if your decision is really on track. And if it's not on track, make smaller mid-course corrections along the way to make sure that you stay on track. And that's where your artificial intelligence and your machine learning really comes into play. Now, there's some Influences both internal and external environments, right? And technology. The technology influences you've got today that are altering AI and ML, this is a moving target. The things you learn today will probably be part of history in a year from now. This is a really fast moving technology. We are learning all sorts of new things every day. We are making specialized ASIC computer systems for this. Google has made something called TensorFlow, which is both a process and a special design computer system for machine language and building models. All that technology is really fastly moving. Your best bet is to do your best to stay on top of it. The other part of it is that you've got some really interesting government things going along the way here. You've got political, economic, sociological, um, psychological, and environmental. You've got more than one thing going on. Now, part of us, because of the era that we were growing up in, right? if you were a part of anything that had to do with the 1980s and early 1990s, you probably read something called cyberpunk. Right? So you probably read William Gibson, you probably read Ian McDonaldson or others right, that kind of talked about this whole new world of technology and how we use big data to define corporations. You had the big evil computer. You know, we had Tron as a movie. Interestingly enough, it's about big data, right? Honestly, it really is. You have political things that are going on. How do we use big data? You have arguments in the United States Congress and the Senate yesterday 
about how big tech is treating data about kids and how we're targeting advertising towards kids, right? We don't worry about, you know, television so much because there are certain rules there and we expect things. But on the technological side, there are political things afoot now to kind of discuss how do we deal with political um, issues and regulatory issues around big data and how big data is used. And we don't really have a way of making it work. The economic viewpoint on this one is also huge, right? If you have a really good data pool and you're going to silo it and you're going to keep it to yourself because it is your competitive advantage and you get hacked or you get ransomware, right? And your big data pool goes bye-bye you lock it out and you don't want to pay it or you can't pay it and you don't have good backups or somehow it gets out and it's in the open and all of a sudden you lose your competitive advantage. What does it do to your economic status of your company? Right? Is that something that's going to cause a run on your stock? Is that something that's going to cause a run on your um, respectability in the, in the world? Are you going to worry about how people look at you? What does that change about your economic situation? could be bad. Sociological and psychological, people are people. So we have things that we do well, we have things that we don't do well, and we kind of live in this really weird world of good data and bad data. So people are going to form opinions. So sociological and psychological are how does society look at big data? How does society look at the people that run big data? How do we look at our biases? How do we look at the way that we express ourselves in terms of data? Um, what ends up happening when you use data the wrong way or you use data in a, in a way that is not conducive to good societal roles or, or increased societal tensions? And then environmental, you know, you're running a big data center, it's going to cost you some money, it's going to use up some energy, it's going to cost some heat and cooling and all the other things that go along with it. You know, you take a look at something like Bitcoin mining, which is um, doing mining for hashes per second, tera hashes per second. It's hugely costly in terms of electricity. There's actually one Bitcoin mining operation that went and bought an old coal-fired power plant in Australia. So they could do their big data mining for Bitcoin. Everyone got upset because it was a really dirty coal plant, coal-fired electric plant. So that looked bad. It didn't give them a good sociological viewpoint into the world. The company was looked at really, really badly, but they did it anyways. So your environmental impact, too, for running your data centers or however you do your data um, really matters here. So there's some really interesting data and its analysis and decision making because you have to do things in a timely, proactive and predictive way. Right, so some of this can be done by machines, and that's not a hard thing, especially if it's timely, especially if you're using IoT and sensor data, you know, sort of like Cone or anyone else that's doing environmental maintenance and things like that, car maintenance, that's all good. It's all timely, right? We know we need to take our car in every 15,000 miles. We know your house sensor, if it's tied to the electric power grid, um, they'll actually turn and turn off your heat for you, right? So again, it's all timely. It's proactive. And that's the hard part because everything we do right now is pretty much so reactive and others we're geared towards reactive processes and the goal here is to try to be more proactive and then predictive that we see it coming and we can take advantage or disadvantage of it early so that it doesn't cause us any problems later on down the road it never shows up you'll find a lot of what we do in information security is proactive and somewhat predictive of what we're doing you'll find a lot of things that happen in marketing to be proactive and try to predict human behavior. So we're already getting there in some certain regards of the business, but most of what we do is gonna be reactive, right? Techno technologies for data analysis and decision support. So group communication and collaboration is number one on this one. And the reason why is because people are often better at cutting through the, the, ch the chaff and getting right to the point, right? but they'll all arrive at different points and they won't arrive at different points at the same time. So you'll have some people in the team or in the group that will arrive at the near correct decision almost immediately. They will immediately intuitively grasp what needs to be done. Then you'll have other people that need to think it through. They are slower thinkers and there's nothing wrong with that. But you wanna to try to, when you're doing group communication and collaboration, to have the same kind of people working with each other. If you have people that are slower and more methodical, group them together. If you have people that can intuitively grasp the issue and come up with a solution that is good, put them in their own group. 
don't try to mix and match these two groups. So group communications and collaboration are super important. Your intuitive people, the people that are able to grasp the issue right away, can communicate and say, hey, this is what's going on, this is what I think needs to be done, this is what I think we need to do to fix it. Turn that over to the more methodical group, let them take a look at it, let them come to an idea, whether they agree or disagree, and come up with a certain proposal, and then let them work together, but let them work together separately. Then you need to have improved data management. Your data has to be clear. Your data has to be clean, and we'll talk about that. And it has to be actionable, right? There's no point in sending me a bunch of junk data and asking me to make a decision off of it because it's not going to work. I need to know really what's going on. I need to be able to intuitively and immediately grasp what's going on either through the dashboard or through the process. And I need to be able to make a decision off of it. In other words, it needs to be actionable. Now, the other problem is managing big data. A lot of people are moving their big data projects into the cloud, and that makes sense, right? Right now, cloud computing really does support big data, whether it's Amazon or Azure or Google. Again, Google with its own specialized equipment and specialized processing through TensorFlow. Managing big pools of data, data that's terabits or petabits in size can become really hard. You need to have a specialist for that. You need to have a specialist in the database size, the data warehousing size, the data lake, and then you need to have a really good data manager, really good data analytics person along the board. That analytics support from your data analyst will really help out. Then overcoming cognitive limits in processing and storing information. That cognitive limit is a human. So humans sometimes don't grasp all of the data that they're looking at. We'll see certain parts of the data, but we'll drop other parts. If you're listening to a conversation, and you'll pick up maybe every third word. So you're probably listening to this and like going, okay, you tuned out, you tuned in. You tuned out, you tuned out some more, you tuned back in. You'll replay this video two or three or four times to make sure that you've grasped all of the whole thing. So you have a cognitive limit. You can only listen to me and my lilting voice so many times. And that makes sense. But you have to understand that when you're looking at a dashboard, you have to take in the whole thing. If your dashboard is too cluttered, if there's too much in your dashboard, if you want to see it all, you hit your cognitive limit probably about three screens into it. And you're not going to go too much far. So you need to make sure that when you're presenting data or you're looking at data, that you're doing it in small enough, short enough chunks, and you're prefacing it with, this is important. This is what you should know. This is what's going to be on the test. This is good ancillary information that you should know about, right? Knowledge management, managing the knowledge that's being presented to you and understanding how that knowledge actually works and functions and whether it's actionable is huge. Make sure that you're doing this. And then anywhere, anytime support. Make sure that if you're doing this kind of data analysis and processes that you do have the ability to do anywhere, anytime support. Make sure that you've got people on board to help with people having to write custom reports. You may have someone that's working across multiple time zones. So if it's two o'clock in the afternoon in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, it's one o'clock in the morning here in Tacoma, Seattle area where I live. So they'll call me up and say, hey, Dan, I need to have this piece of data. I need to understand what's going on. I need to have it by four o'clock my time. So that's three o'clock my time. It's one o'clock. I just woke up. So again, it's that anywhere, anytime support that's got to happen because people are going to be doing a lot of things that are going to be pretty ad hoc along the way. So you really want to pay attention to that. Now, inside the book, you see something called Simon's process, right? Three major phases, intelligence, design, and choice. So you have intelligence and you have objects within that intelligence organization and things that you need to do. So you have organization objectives, search and scanning procedures, data collection, identification, ownership, classification, and statement. So that's all pretty standard. If you're in business at all, you pretty much understand the idea of problem classification, the problem statement, and problem ownership. That's all really standard project management kind of thing. So now we're getting a blend of two different disciplines, data analytics and project management. But you have to convert that problem statement that's written in text over to an algorithm. Interesting. So there's where your data analytics is going to come in. Problem identification, is it really a problem or not? And then where's my data? Where do I go and find all my data? Is it a data lake already or do I need to get a new source of data? What is that data going to look like? Is it clean? And then how do I search and scan that data collection for that? Then once we get to the problem statement, once all that's been done, then we validate the model. We do the design. We formulate a model, set a criteria for choice, search for alternatives, and predict and measure outcomes. Now remember, you want to try to measure your outcome against at least two check marks in the past to make sure that you hit those two check marks in the past so your model looks like it's actually reflecting reality. 
and then check out any alternatives. Your choice, solution to the model, sensitivity analysis, selection to the best or good alternatives, and then plan for implementation. Now, you either have success, yes or no, but it has to come back and reflect on reality. So those three steps, intelligence, design, and choice, really help define how you're gonna model your problem and what your approach to that problem is gonna be. So there are some issues in data collection that I do want you to know about. The number one issue is that the data is not available. All right, as results, the model is made and relies on potentially inaccurate estimates. So data not being available or data being dirty or data not being in the right format or data not being clean, data not being in a format that the machine can learn from can be really problematic. The good part is we're changing our algorithms along the way to deal with dirtier and dirtier data. Um, along the way, we're dealing with more unstructured data as we go through the day. So we're learning how to work with these things. Again, technology is still in its infancy. Um, obtaining data may be expensive. So I may need a public data source. I may need a private data source. So if I want to go back and I want to target a specific market segment, I may not have the data on that market segment. And I may have to go buy it. And that can be really super expensive, but I need it. So obtaining data may be expensive and that may not be a cost that you're ready to pay or a cost that you've expected to. Data not be, may be accurate or precise enough for your needs. A lot of marketing data is really vague, really generic. It's really hard to do things. If you go and you take a look at Facebook's marketing data, it's weird, right? It's really not anything that's precise at all. If you go in and you take a look at how Facebook has marked you, if you go in and you take a look at your marketing data for you, go and check and see how close it is to reality. My marketing data in Facebook is so way off the map. It is so off base that it is absolutely inaccurate to describe me as a customer. Now, interestingly enough, and I find this interestingly amusing, is that the data on TikTok that TikTok has on me is actually really super accurate. They give me really good ads for stuff I'm actually looking for. So if I'm getting ready to go on a trip, I'm ready to go do something else, and I've been out on Travelocity, getting my tickets all set up, and going out, taking a look and seeing what kind of weekend trips I can take and other things, TikTok will start showing me travel ads for things that I can do at my destination immediately, that night, same night, which is great. I like that because it gives me some alternatives. Facebook won't catch up with me until I come back. <laughs> Seriously, they're that bad. So that accuracy or precision really matters. And you'll see it when you go into your social media and compare and contrast your different social media platforms with what you think they know about you. It's fascinating, right? Data estimates are often subjective. You know, again, we have biases, it's subjective. It may not be accurate to you or to your customer base or anything else. And if you're making decisions off of flawed data, your decision is gonna be flawed, right? Data may be insecure. So data may be subject to alteration. You may have something in there, you run your model once and then someone comes and alters the data and your model changes. That's a big thing because if you're buying data from someone else or if you're tying up to a public data pool, that public data pool may be moving around all the time. It may be changing. Important data that influences the result may be qualitative and it is soft. So quantitative is actually pretty easy. It's data, it's, it's numbers, it's physical fact. Qualitative is a little bit harder because it's people's opinions, right? If I wanted to get an opinion of a marketing program or a marketing process, I would sit down and do a Delphi panel, a round table of people, give them some pizza, and sit down and talk about how effective that marketing campaign was towards you because I want their words back. The problem is in the coding because people's words are imprecise. Oh, it was great. Okay, what was great about it? Oh, no, it was just great. I really liked it. Well, what did you like about it? Oh, I liked the little fuzzy animal that was in there. I don't remember a fuzzy animal in the ad campaign at all. So it's soft data. It may influence the results and things that may show up in people's minds may not necessarily be part of the actual campaign. You have to learn how to code your qualitative data to try to get it to make sense. And anything that's outside of that statistical reality, there may not be a little fuzzy animal, but they think there's one, drop that data. It's not going to be valuable. And then there may be too many data points or there may be too much data to actually really come up with a good answer to what you need to do. So sometimes you need to pare back your data just to just get to where you need to go. You may need to cut your haystack down a little bit just to make sure it works better. Then outcomes or results may occur over an extended period. As a result, revenues, expenses, and profits will be recorded at different points in time. Time becomes a factor in this, right? To overcome this difficulty, a present value approach can be used if the results are quantifiable. So you may report out quarterly, 
but your receipts are coming in daily. So you could actually do a daily receipt dashboard with a weekly, a monthly, and a quarterly roll-up. And then that quarterly is what you're using for your reporting out. Right? You may have KPIs, but your expenses may come out monthly. So you're bringing in money daily and you think you're doing really, really good, but then your expenses go out on the last day of the month and you find out you take a really big hit to your profit. Managers are going to be like, oh, well, what, what happened to all that money? What did you spend it on? And you're going to be like, well, that's just my normal monthly bill. And that's the problem because management might not understand how time, revenue, expenses, and profits will be recorded at different points in time. They may just want to see the profit statement on the fifth day of the month. So it depends on your management. So it's assumed that future data will be similar to historical data, but that's not always the case. All right, so sometimes, and we are really famous for this, we're gonna change the data format. <laughs> Right? We're going to change the way the database works. We're going to change the way the table is actually built. We're going to change our indexes. We do this to ourselves all the time. So change has to be predicted and included in the analytics, but you want to make sure that if you do a hard or soft fork on your data, whether you're changing the table, whether you're changing the collation, whether you're changing the input, whether you're changing the way it's indexed, that you have a way to go back and still reference the past data. You're going to either do a hard fork and then you'll have two different dashboards or you'll be a soft fork and there'll be a marker line on, on the data point where you're actually going through and say this is where something changed in the back end processing. Um, people are really good at that. We do that all the time because in sake of efficiency, right? We're never going to leave something alone and think it's good enough. So your problem design choice and implementation phases, the problem, again, we're going to classify, take it down, break it down into smaller chunks, and we're going to decide who owners, who owns it, our design, our models, how do we want to do our models, check for bias, make sure that, that there is a little implicit and explicit bias as possible, choice, implementation, and then the feedback phase where we're going through and making sure that everything works the way that we want it to work. Now, our decision support system framework, this is really kind of neat, you'll find this in the book. Degree of structuredness, types of control, decision support metrics, and then computer support for structured, unstructured, and semi-structured decisions. So this is really just kind of how you want to take a look at how your data is actually done. So a structured um, data can give you some really good operational control because you're monitoring account receivable, it's real money, it's a real number, it's nothing about it is subjective, right? Semi-structured, scheduling, production, um, can be problematic. People go on vacation, people get sick, people come, people go, production line may fail, um, part may go out, controlling inventory, you can't predict yet on how many people are going to really want X widget at Y location. And then unstructured, you know, I'm going to buy software every now and then, as needed, when needed. So that's really kind of very unstructured. Approving loans, it depends, right? Operating a help desk, well, well some days will be more busy than others. 8 a.m. people logging in on Monday is always going to be the busiest time. Friday afternoon at one o'clock is also going to be your second busiest time because people are trying to get out for the weekend and if they start having problems they'll just pick up the help desk and call. So depending on what you've got and how it's working, understanding this type of control and type of decision making process is really going to help you when you start doing um, machine learning, AI, and big data processes along the way. So decision support systems are another big part of it. And there are a number of steps and characteristics and capabilities of decision support systems. Now, you're using someone else's software. You're using something either you built or something that someone else built for you. When you're doing a decision support software, it can be something like Cognos. It can be something you built in Tableau. It can be something you built in Power BI. It can be something that you bought that ties into all of these other systems, right? Cognos, Tableau, Power BI, whatever. So. There are 14 things you need to know about characteristics, right? One, provide support for semi-structured and unstructured problems. And this is really big because your data is going to come structured, unstructured, and semi-structured. You want to make sure you can take in any data source into your data lake. Supports managers at all levels. And this is important. If you have something at the production level and your production line and your manager of the production floor needs to understand how all the machines are working and make sure that all the machines are doing what they need to do and make sure that all the people are doing what they need to do at the machines. And if there's a problem at that level, that it's flagged, noted, and that person is notified and that person can go take care of the problem. Managers need to know how much outage time there is on the production line what issues are being shown on the production line, how much product's coming in and going out. So your data at various levels is going to be different. And you want to make sure your dashboards, your data presentation 
is different for each person at whatever level they need to have to do their job, right? Supports individuals and groups. So there may be some team things, there may be some individual things, whether it's production floor or production group or a marketing group or something else. Make sure that your information can support however the company is structured for that project, right? Supports interdependent or sequential decisions, and that's gonna be something that's gonna happen all the time. If A, then B, then C. If A or B or C, you're gonna go through that sequential decision-making process and maybe do some scenario planning along the way. Supports intelligence, design choice and implementation, all the, all the decisions that need to be made for that project. Support a variety of decision processes and styles. And remember, leadership is situational, so is decision-making. So we're gonna have all the things that we do making decisions all the time and how we alter them and how they go about things. So supporting a variety of decision processes and styles is really important because people are individualistic. Is adaptable and flexible, that goes along with point six. Provides interactivity and ease of use. I can carve out some data on my own so I can be interactive, I can scenario plan, I can drag and drop some things around, I can maybe move a slider left and back. It's really easy to use. Um, get a good UI UX person in there. Make sure that they make really effective dashboards. Improves effectiveness and efficiency, and others I can make better decisions because I have this data. If the data is not helping you make better decisions, then you don't need that data or it's not being presented correctly or something else is going on. Right? Provides a complete human control of the process. So in other words, humans can go in and overstep, check, make sure everything works at each step and make sure that the data and the presentation is as free of bias as possible at every step in the process provides ease of development by end users. Again, with Cognos and things like that, you use the API or you have a report writer. Salesforce.com has a report generation system, so really kind of neat if you've ever worked in any of those systems. Tableau and Power BI, same thing. So make sure that when you're doing development that it's at least something that's easy enough to use that you're not having to ramp up super huge. If you take a look at the generics around report writing right now, report generation in Salesforce, Tableau, Power BI, Cognos, and all these other big decision support systems that are out there, um, it's really well documented. You have a really good understanding of the API, a really good understanding of the fields, and you need to have a really good understanding of the data that's inside those databases. But once you've got that, it's really easy to write a report in any of those four platforms. Provides models and analysis. There will be some pre canned reports, pre canned models, a uh, way to analyze data and all the rest of it. But you may have to go back and train a new model. So production previous mo models and analysis are still there. We can use them, but again, we're gonna be retraining our model all the time, depending on where we're at in our machine learning process. Provides data access. If I need to, I can get right to the raw data, right? There may be something in there that catches my attention from a security viewpoint, like why did this happen at this time? And why does this keep on happening at 1.32 in the morning? What is it about this blip? Right? I need to go into the data. I need to actually see that point in the data. So give me data access, because I'm gonna want that. And then it can be standalone, integrated, or web-based, right? It can be standalone on its own system, doing its own thing, integrated with all the other sensors and all the other data inputs that we've got going on and parsed and done and in my data lake, whether that's in the cloud or local. And then I want a web-based tool. So I want either a dashboard in SharePoint or just a tool out there on the web, something interactive, something I can move things around with, right? Web-based tools really help because then I can also put them on my mobile phone. Right? If I have access to that web page, I can put it on my mobile phone and I can be in the middle of the field doing what I need to do, take a look at really cool stuff and still being supportive of the people back at home, being supportive of the people in the field and making good decisions at the same time because I need to. So decision support systems have all of these 14 points and you really do want to pay attention to them. So components of a decision support system, again, is the data management subsystem. And this is just basically what do you need? Where are you? So you've got other computer-based systems. You've got intranet, intranet, and extranet. You've got data points, databases. You may be doing something with um, ERP, uh, points of sale, legacy data, web data. And so you're going to have data management, your model, external models, and then just basically how do you get it down to the manager, the user, through the user interface, and then the organizational knowledge base that you have. Every organization has some kind of KM going on right now where either that's help desk or whether that's project or whether that's SharePoint or something else as part of project knowledge bases, which is a big part of how we do management because projects are a really interesting viewpoint into how well the company works. And if you have lessons learned documents from your projects, that can all go into an organizational knowledge base to make the organization more efficient, more effective. 
In your model management subsystem, you have your model base, your model base, your modeling language, your model directory, your model execution, integration, and command processor. Pretty straightforward on that one. And in your user interface subsystem, you have your natural language input. Show me all the things that were sold between January 1st and January 30th, 2021. Right, that's a natural language input. So examples, uh, price, look up the 64 gig iPhone X. Conver currency conversion, what is 10 US dollars and euros or Saudi reals, right? Sports scores, game times, you know, what is the weather for 98040? What is the Doppler radar looking like today? Um, how do I make a decision, right? All those things are going to be really clear, natural language, how we speak every day. And you really want that on your user interface subsystem. Now, the cool part is there's actual now native language pro preprocessors. And, um, you have things like Siri now and other that will help you with that natural language input. So there's a lot of already predefined models for natural language parsing that are out there that you can integrate into your big data model. Really super easy and it's super cool. Knowledge-based system management. Really good, knowledge-based management subsystem. Support any of the other subsystems or act as an independent component, right? So it provides intelligence to augment the decision maker's own um, decision or to help understand a user's query to provide a more consistent answer. And again, that's just something that we work with. Every system's got a knowledge base management somewhere. There is some kind of KM system in most companies. So you can use that to kind of balance out your decision making process by using uh, past data or legacy data or just data that we know already works within the organization. So what's kind of interesting though is that there's actually an evolution here for decision support systems. And right now we are in the automation phase of this in the 2020s. So way back in the day in the 1970s, decision support systems, again, were pretty primitive. Computers were pretty primitive. You had GEIS 1000s or PEP 1170s. Um, you had really early prototype AI expert systems, but wow, we really didn't understand how to program these things. We thought it was gonna be easy and it ended up being really, really hard. So we went to more routine reporting. You went to the data center, you said, I need X. And then the next day you'd come and you'd pick up a big pile of 132 column green white paper. And it was ugly, right? Now we moved into the 80s. We started getting into more of your PCs. You started getting into other things along the way, bigger, bigger, better server models. You started getting into um, Windows. We started getting into Solaris. We started getting into some really interesting operating systems along the way for Linux and Unix and all the other things. We really exploded out what we're going to do. We started building relational database systems. We started building on-demand static reporting. How many people back in the day remember things like um, Access, Microsoft Access. We used Access for a lot of our reporting functions, right? In the 1990s, we've got started some really prototype data warehousing, started some dashboards and scorecards were really popular. Executive information systems, which are still pretty primitive, but at least help make better decisions, right? And then as we got into the 2000s, 2010s, and 2020s, everything started exploding. We started doing a lot better stuff. We started bringing in cloud computing, came in in 2009, right? We started really working with it big time. You know, cloud computing actually started back in 2007, 2006 um, with Google and with Amazon. So social networks, media analytics, and memory databases, you started getting into memcache, elastic cache, things that would speed up your, your data pools. Um, you could actually keep common queries in memory. Computer systems started becoming more and more and more capable and the cloud really blew out the things that you could do. And right now we're into cloud-based smart decision making systems, AI, deep learning uh, from uh, the Internet of Things, sensors, either that's through um, environmental, to production, to um, power, to product delivery, to pipelines, to ships, to containers, you name it, everything's got a sensor on it. Automated analytics, um, and now you're seeing things like blockchain starting to come into play to make sure that all the stuff works from the FDA's actually implemented and recommended an entire blockchain solution that relies on automated analytics, IoT, and sensors. So there's a big difference between where we were back in the day to where we are now, and it's just gonna keep on getting more and more exciting and more and more interesting because it really is a huge, gigantic Lego set, but it's a Lego set that has to help and support a company make better decisions, get their product to marketing better. So. Framework of business intelligence, doing our business thing, definitions of BI, the history of BI, and the architecture. Right. So as you kind of take a look at the graphics, you can kind of see that we have a data warehouse environment, a business analytics environment, and then a performance and a strategy. So 
our performance and strategy really does kind of focus back on the business analytics environment, but our data warehouse is where we're getting all of our data resources. So that analytics environment is really where we're starting to carve out how do we present things to management. So again, it's that whole idea of the user interface, the dashboards, the information that we're giving to people, whether it's going to be prefixed, pre-scanned data, right, as a dashboard, or we're going to let them do ad hoc queries, or whether we're going to accelerate some of our data by using some kind of caching method, whether that's memcache, elastic cache, or DAX, depending on what the data looks like, whether it's structured, unstructured, relational, or non-relational. There are a lot of things that go into that technical staff data warehouse environment, and then the business analytics environment that's going to run on top of it. The more you know about how that works, the more effective you're going to be in working on this job or even just using the system itself. So data warehouses are the foundation of business intelligence. So there's transaction processing versus analytic processing. You know, there's different kinds of processing. It could be batch, it could be data text, it could be all just regular things that people are doing on the internet. It could be your service logs, it can be your router logs, it can be your SSH logs. So your data is gonna come in from a whole lot of different things. So Transaction processing is taking all that simple data that's coming in off your sensors and putting it into a database. Analytic processing is where you get into the modeling and the really, really cool stuff, right? That's where you're doing all of your data, test mining, all of your dashboard, your web stuff, your custom built applications, routine business reporting and everything else. You're taking in a bunch of data, you're either transforming it, you're learning from it, you're putting it into a database, and then you're writing really cool queries against it to try to get to what you wanna do. So that data warehouse is your foundation. That data warehouse is huge, whether that's an Amazon Redshift or whether that's some other big data lake processing system or whether it's your whole network, right? There are now systems that will allow you to use your whole network, your whole cloud infrastructure or just your whole in-house private data network to go scan everything for, for solutions. There may be things on someone's hard drive that will help make a decision better. So being able to parse documents and spreadsheets and PDFs and videos and pictures and all the other data like that will really help out in a lot of ways to make things a lot better, right? Appropriate planning and alignment with business strategy, right? A, a center can demonstrate how business intelligence is clearly linked to strategy and execution of strategy. So again, you're going to be using some kind of business intelligence to help you make decisions and you should have dashboards you should actually either be using uh, dashboards as part of documentation right which is interesting in case you've never thought of that or dashboards as a way of using this in your weekly stand-up meeting a part of your kickoff meetings so the center can serve to encourage interaction between potential business and user communities and the information systems organization right a center can serve as a repository and disseminator of best business intelligence practices among different lines of businesses so you can become kind of a clearinghouse. Usually this will end up as part of project management and project management and data analytics will work really closely with each other on this one, especially if they're going to be doing um, a repository of data or lessons learned or anything else. All this stuff will show up on whatever, I'm just going to say SharePoint site, but it can be any content management system that you're using to plan and support whatever decision you're making or whatever the project is, right? You're setting standards of excellence and business intelligence practices that can be advocated and encouraged throughout the company. So there are gonna be things you're using that are gonna have, hey, best practices, you should use these for that. So Cognos has some best practices that as a user you should know. Tableaus are a little bit different. Power BI from, from Microsoft are very different from Cognos's. So you should share those out. You should make sure that people understand how those best practices work and then have someone handy to advocate. There's nothing more interesting than having a decision support system with someone on the back end as a data analyst that is always so busy they can never pick up the phone and help out or having a help desk that doesn't know how the BI system works. So make sure you've got a standard of excellence and people that can advocate for that and encourage. And that's going to be by being able to answer the phone or answer a text or answer an email in a timely manner, whether it's help desk or an actual data analytics department. The IS organization can learn a great deal through interaction with user communities. So one user may be always wanting a certain kind of data at a certain time. Well, you can pre-cache that for them, make their life easier. That will make someone's day. Seriously, if you can, if it's a simple thing, you can just go ahead, pre-cache it, boom, done, there you go, everyone's happy. And it really makes you look good as a data analyst, right? The business user community and the IS organization can better understand why the platform must be flexible enough to provide for changing business requirements. And understand no business is static, right? If it was, we'd still be making Ford Model Ts. 
businesses change, times change, everything changes. Companies go out of business because they can't change, right? Um, while we've gotten into, into the habit of propping things up, companies still fail at a pretty regular basis. So understand that your decision platform also needs to be able to accommodate change and is flexible enough to, for changing requirements. Some of those requirements may be a new product and you won't have a whole lot of data on it, so you'll be relying on public data of dubious quality. So kind of think about how you're going to manage all that in the process. And then your center can help important stakeholders like CS high-level executives, the CXO suite, play an important role in terms of how that manager makes decisions and what decisions they need to make and what the process looks like. So analytics, the process of developing actionable decisions or recommendations for actions based on insights generated from historical data. So that's the big word right there, actionable, right? Make sure that it's not just, oh, this is really cool. That's nice. This is a great story. No. Oh, so this is the decision that we made in the past. Well, how did that work out? Well, if it wasn't a good decision, if it was a bad or an ugly decision, well, let's change that around a little bit, right? So we're going to describe something, we're going to predict something, and then we're going to be prescriptive about what we should do with it, right? So descriptive is I opened up a new product line, I'm making grit city water, and I'm going to label it with a, with a, with an octopus because those things fit my town, right? That's what I did. Right? It was really cool. I really liked it. Now, predictive, what will happen? Well, I'm hoping that it will sell because water sells really, really well, especially at certain events. So we'll try to get it into the stadium. We'll try to get it into all the city-sponsored events. We'll try to get it into all the touristy stores. We'll try to get it into the regular grocery stores because grocery stores like helping out local things. So why did it happen? When will it happen? How did it work? Did it really work? Right? And then prescriptive, what should I do? Well, I need to go contact all my grocery stores. I need to contact these people. Why should I do it? Because I want to sell more product. Right. So your prescriptive part on this is what are the steps I need to take after that? So I can go back and say, well, I worked with this grocery store and it's worked really, really well. So I want to work with that grocery store some more. But I worked with this tourist store and it didn't really work. Right? They didn't order a whole bunch. They bought one case. They really didn't try to push it. They didn't really try to sell it. It took them six months to sell 24 bottles of, of Grit City water probably won't go back to them. So again, prescriptive. Who's selling more of my product for me? Who's doing me a better turn on the market? So your business analytics can really help you understand how your product works per segment and sometimes down to the individual store who's ordering more. And then how did that product sell inside that store? So you've heard me refer to everything throughout this lecture as big data. Big data refers to the data that cannot be stored in a single storage unit. And again, it's usually something that's on a big, huge honking database, a data warehouse, or something that's distributed across the entire corporate network. You will hear me use big data interchangeability with data lake, data pool, data process, warehousing. To me, yeah. So just so you all know, you're going to hear me use that same word all the way across the board for all this stuff. So. Analytics examples and selected domains. I really kind of like this one, right? Sports. How many of us play fantasy football or fantasy basketball, right? We're all trying to predict who's going to be the best quarterback and who's going to be the best linebacker and who's going to be the best tight end and who's going to be the best cornerback and who's going to be blah, 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 right? Who's going to be the best center, right? All the rest of it. So sports is really kind of interesting because you can actually make some really interesting predictive pools in the cloud and then use that for your fantasy football league or your fantasy ba basketball league or your fantasy baseball league. It's kind of interesting. 538, I know they do politics, but they also do a lot of sports analytics. Really fascinating what they do on the predictive things. Right? Business office, that one's pretty straightforward. We've been talking about that all day. Healthcare. Now, this one's even more interesting because you can actually predict by populations. Right? If you see a big spike in measles in one population, you can actually go back and check and see if they've had their, their vaccine or they didn't have vaccine or where did people come from? Did they come from a country? Uh, what was the travel patterns in and out look like? What are the travel patterns for people coming in from countries that are known to have measles? You know, healthcare can be really good from that big social construct, right? Of how do we track disease pro progression through a community? And then you can break that down and you can actually send that to doctors in specific zip codes and say, okay, you're seeing an increase in this kind of disease. You're seeing a decrease in that. Oh, this is a cancer hotspot. Really important. You can do really good work there. And then retail value chain again to going into grocery stores, going into other kinds of stores, trying to sell my grit city water with my octopus logo. Artificial intelligence is really kind of neat because it's based on theories from several scientific fields and it's really a big science fiction kind of thing still, right? So the major goal of AI is to create intelligent machines that can do tasks currently done by people. 
the hard part we're having right now is people are unpredictable. So it really makes it kind of interesting and in trying to get people and machines to do reasoning, thinking, learning, and problem solving when we don't even know how we do it ourselves. Right? We don't know how people work. We don't know how people think. We don't know how people learn. We have a lot of learning theories on adult learners versus child learning versus baby learning versus as you learn all the way through progression on age. Where do we want to lock that AI into? And then how do we solve problems? Right? Again, some people have an intuitive grasp of the problem. They will immediately see the correct answer. They will do the logic jump. They will go and they will have the best answer to whatever the problem is. And they will do it all in a few seconds. You will have others that are more, more slow, more methodical, and take a lot longer time to come to the same conclusion as someone who will all just jump in. So artificial intelligence can be kind of interesting because we still don't know all the answers. We still don't know how we work. So there's a significant reduction in the cost of performing work, right? especially if it's something that's repeatable, sustainable, um, something that has to do with manufacturing, something that can be broken down into repeatable, processable steps, really works well here. Right, especially manual work. You know, that's why you're seeing a lot of your factories and a lot of production lines going to AI controlled manufacturing lines. You see a lot of that in Tesla. You see an awful that, a lot of that with the Ford F-150 electric vehicle. Right, The amount of automation that's going on in there that's run by AI testing every component before it goes into the car is actually really kind of interesting. Work can be performed way faster than a human can, right? Because it's not going to get bored. It's not going to get distracted. It's not going to wander. It's not going to have a Monday morning or a Friday afternoon. Monday morning dragging in, oh, I don't want to go to work. Friday afternoon, oh, I need to get out of here because it's a party, it's weekend, yay, right? Work is consistent in general, more consistent than human work because it's focused on one thing. And again, it's machine-based, so it's just going to go do what it needs to go do. Increased productivity and profitability as well as competitive advantage are the major drivers of AI. We're seeing some very real solutions to this going on in things that we've been studying for the last hundred years. So you have been, or we have been as a culture, studying the assembly line for the last hundred years. We've broken things down into time sequencing, number of steps, and all the rest of it. All those things can be programmed really, really well. The problem with AI comes in when we're trying to make intuitive guesses. Will this product work in the market? Will we'll be able to jump into doing something else along the way? what does this creative logo look like? How should we create a logo? And we're working on that. We've got AI now that will actually do art. It's kind of weird, freaky art, but it's still art. So we're getting to that point now where we're getting AI to the point where it can start doing some of the more creative things that we do, which is interesting that we're getting to that point now um, and only within a short number of years. So there's some major AI technologies right now, both on knowledge-based and biometric-based technologies, but all of these have support theories, tools and platforms and mechanisms that go into this. There are a lot of them and we'll be covering them all the way through this class. So this is just kind of like, know what's coming. There's a lot of different technologies out there. They're all knowledge-based or they're all biometric-based and there's a lot of theories, tools and platforms and mechanisms to support them. Right? There are, what makes this even more interesting is when you start getting into the convergence of analytics and AI. So there's differences between it, right? but why not combine them? Right? Because AI works faster than humans do. Right? If you can do some kind of predictive modeling, AIs are really good at coming up with a predictive number of realistic probabilities based on statistics. It's math. As long as your data is coded correctly, Right, and that's the big one right there. AI can actually spot some of the anomalies way quicker than a human being ever would. So AI-based analytics can really help spot the anomaly or spot the opportunity in the haystack. And it's a really good thing because it can do it as a, as a, as a statistical treatment of the data itself. So we have an entire analytics ecosystem. In the middle of it is the analytics user and the organization, and that is getting pressure from regulators, policymakers, because it opens up some opportunities to do things with how people behave. So there's a lot of things we do we don't want people to know about, and sometimes big data will reveal those, like my browser history, um, or what I'm, or places I go, things I do, um, where I am physically located, my, graphic, my geographical information from my phone and other stuff. Um, those are all good things for regulators and policymakers. Um, the analytics industry, analytics and, and the influencers for it. Influencers are really looking out for their product and are not looking at you. Um, academic institution and certification agencies, we're going to be playing one, two, three catch up for the next 40, 50 years. It's just the way it's going to work because this is a fast moving, hot technology. The fact that you're here is great. The fact that this course exists is great. Um, this is just a, a primer. It's going to be, there's going to be so much more going on 
over the next coming decades. That will be really interesting. It's not going to be a settled technology for a while. Application developers and industry specific or general um, can really help add to these things. You're going to start seeing a lot more conferences. You'll start seeing a lot more things in the ACM. You'll start seeing a lot more paper on this. So all this stuff is going to be pushing pressure down on the user or in the organization. And then you have all the providers, right? Data generate, generation, data management, data warehouse, middleware, data service providers, and analytics focused software developers. All of these people are going to be part of your ecosystem helping you get off the ground with your data analytics process. So that's kind of the summary of this whole thing. Just go ahead and review the chapter highlights. Make sure you're in, in the 11E version of the book. Review the key terms and then complete the weekly homework. And make sure you get everything in by Sunday night. So that's it for this lecture. Kind of lengthy, but it was kind of fun. I'm really glad that you were here. And thank you very much. And I will see you in the next lecture.